Thank you, everybody. Good morning. Um, as Kevin has said, I'm Barry O'Dwyer. I run the UK business of Standard Life Aberdeen, which, um, as you probably know, is a FTSE 100 global asset manager. But actually, when I was invited uh, to address this conference, I was chief exec of Standard Life in the UK and Europe. Uh, for reasons best known in the UK, all businesses describe themselves as UK and Europe, as if UK isn't part of Europe. Um, <laughs> But uh, maybe more of that or not. Um, but, uh, but actually, our, our, my business, our business, has been through a huge amount of change, and I'll actually cover that in some of my rem remarks this morning. Um, my company's roots, though, as you, as you know, uh, are in insurance. Standard Life is one of the oldest and best-known life insurance brands in the UK and in Ireland. We started in the UK in 1825, uh, followed rapidly by uh, the establishment of our Irish branch in 1834. But in truth, Standard Life has been moving away from taking insurance risk for over a decade, uh, prompted initially by um, a changing mic macroeconomic and regulatory environment, but accelerated most recently by what I want to talk about today, the consumer and societal revolution that's underway. We aren't the first insurance company that um, has been impacted by the change in society, and we won't be the last. Now, the merger last year between Standard Life, PLC, and Aberdeen Asset Management, and the subsequent sale of the insurance business of Standard Life to the Phoenix Group has transitioned my firm's, um, or sorry, has completed the transition of my firm from a life company to an investment company. Standard Life Aberdeen now provides no insurance products. Uh, we've moved over a relatively short period of time from an insurance house with a captive asset manager to an asset manager that works with insurers and other distributors to deliver modern investment products. I think we are an interesting case study because many commentators think that we're at the forefront of a complete shakeup of the insurance and asset management uh, sectors in the UK. Now, not every, everything transfers from one market to another, but I think it might be useful to consider whether there's any read across for executives working in the Irish market or working on the continent. Um, before I start, I should declare an interest. As Kevin says, I, I, I come from an insurance heritage. Um, I started in Dublin, actually, uh, training as, a, as an actuary with uh, Standard Life. In fact, uh, that was 30 years ago, and I did recognize, alarmingly, recognized a few faces uh, over coffee earlier. Um, but I, as an actuary, I have a keen appreciation of the, of the value that uh, insurance can play, the role that insurance can play in helping customers. I don't want anybody to get the impression that this is an asset manager, uh, a presentation from an asset manager um, preaching to the insurance industry. Um, Kevin mentioned I'm also a non-exec director of Phoenix, which is Standard Life Aberdeen's strategic partner for insurance in the UK, um, and Phoenix also operate the Standard Life brand under license in Ireland. So if I start my comments with the most familiar territory for me, which is the life and pensions industry, and right across the world, retirement has been changing. Uh, we know that some people are conditioned to the idea that they'll spend um, as much time in retirement as they've spent at work uh, because they've seen their parents do this, and some lucky families have even seen two generations uh, ex enjoy that sort of extraordinary benefit. Um, I think, though, that we all know objectively that this is not sustainable because it is prohibitively expensive for most people. And the reality is that the generation that enjoyed that benefit, uh, the, the generations that enjoyed that benefit, were the ones that were lucky enough to be born in the golden age of DB pensions, when employers and states unwittingly took on liabilities that ended up costing them a fortune. Uh, this was an unplanned, massive transfer of wealth from capital to labor in respect of people who worked in that golden age. Now, the demise of DB caused a lot of hand-wringing in the UK. I'm sure it's no, it's no different uh, in any other developed market. We talked about a pensions crisis, uh, berated the public for not saving enough, and set out to educate people that they should be paying an unaffordable amount of money into their pension, making the minority of people who actually engaged with that message feel awful about themselves and the 
the miserable state their life had become. And uh, guess what? It didn't work. Uh, people switched off from the negativity and they decided that they would instead muddle through. Um, and in, in a sense, they were right. Uh, muddling through is a strategy. As long as your behavior doesn't deviate massively from the rest of your peers, you can always use your demographic weight at the ballot box to ensure you elect people who promise you a greater slice of the cake than maybe you're entitled to. And I'm not saying that the people in the UK or in any other market made this decision consciously, but with millions of people muddling through, that's, where, that's certainly where we found ourselves in the UK. However, um, the muddle through strategy is suboptimal. Um, it gives people no safety net if illness or recession strikes, for instance. Um, and the UK government decided that it was much better to help workers to build up some capital so that they had more choices later in life. Uh, this combined with a social security safety net should help people to manage their later life more uh, successfully. Those who remain fit and healthy can work as long as they need to, and those who have fewer choices will have some money to fall back on. Um, I believe this is fundamentally a more honest, more adult, and, and more optimistic message for customers. Instead of people uh, telling people that they weren't doing enough, uh, we at Standard Life introduced a new strapline to the brand, uh, which is, there's a lot to look forward to. Our marketing became much more optimistic, more inspiring, and a bit more fun. Um, now, I want to just show you, it's not an advert for Standard Life, but I want to just show you how, the, how we're bringing that to life. We've got a great local marketing team in Dublin who've really taken this to heart. So have a look at one of the adverts that we're running currently. Your purpose in life is to find your voice. I worked a variety of roles in the brewing world. I didn't give retirement an awful lot of thought. I think if I had done, I probably wouldn't have retired. And if I hadn't retired, I wouldn't be where I am now. Well, the first four years were great. I spent a lot of time down in, in West Cork. I just found myself getting itchy feet again. I thought, geez, there's got to be more to life than this. I started getting back into brewing with some friends of mine, and boom, I was ready to go, you know. It is wonderful to have that second opportunity. This is a small company, and I do all the brewing. It's cool. I think people of our age have a huge amount to offer. Destination was to put a lot of hops into it, make it very bitter. I would encourage anybody who's retiring, go out and find your voice. Give it socks, find your voice, and then just do it for the rest of your life. The whole world is at your feet. Just get off your knees. You know? <laughs> my name is William. This is my second life. It's great. It's quite interesting. It's quite a. It's a very, very different positioning of um, uh, the retirement challenge than than we would have done uh, ten years ago. And, and as I say, I think it's it's uh, likely to be a huge, a great deal more successful with uh, with customers. Now, like the UK, the Irish government has announced plans, as you know, for pensions reforms, which will look to introduce uh, your version of auto enrolment retirement, uh, the auto enrolment retirement saving schemes for employees from 2022. Uh, so what can we learn in Ireland from what happened in the UK? Well, firstly, it works. Uh, almost 10 million employees in the UK have now been enrolled in a workplace pension scheme, and it has been by, uh, I think, everybody's um, uh, reckoning, a huge success. Opt-out rates are running at below 10%, so optimists believe that employees really get this and are in it for the long run. Uh, cynics point to the low employee contribution rates and argue that when that most people haven't noticed what's happening yet, uh, and uh, but when they do, the, the uh, opt-out rates will increase when their contributions step up to five percent, which is due to happen in April 2019. Now, as is often the case, the cynics are only partly right. Uh, real incomes in the UK are under uh, massive pressure, and each uh, increase in contributions puts more strain on families. But we got through the increase in contributions in April 2018 from 1% to 3% uh, without a material increase uh, in opt-out rates, and most people 
believe that we'll achieve the same next April when it goes to 5%. The industry reaction to the initiative has been interesting. After initially arguing that the private sector couldn't possibly deliver a solution at a 1% annual charge, which was the original uh, hypothesis, uh, providers like Standard Life, uh, my firm, then set about uh, designing the simplest DC pension scheme imaginable. Uh, the result was what we called our good-to-go auto enrollment so solution, with the promise that employers could set up a scheme online in six minutes. Um, and that worked, it was very, very popular, and we signed up um, tens of thousands of employers on the back of that initiative. Now, charges are still a hot topic in the UK, as I know they are here. Uh, when the UK government introduced a charge cap for auto enrollment schemes of 75 basis points on the default fund, uh, Standard Life's response was to continue to offer the good to go solution, but to charge employers a monthly fee for the product, whereas previously, it had been free for the employers to operate. Um, that, was, that was quite a tough decision, but I think it was a sensible way to approach the charging debate. The reality is somebody has to pay, and it's a societal choice as to how we split the cost of pension provisions between members and employers. If we push down the cost to members faster than scale is delivering benefits for the uh, industry, then employers need to pick up the tab. Um, at least in the short term. And what we found in the UK was that that led to a better conversation with policymakers and politicians because, um, unfortunately, up until that point, the, uh, the charge cap looked like a free policy. Um, all that was happening was you were cutting the income to insurance companies. Nobody, no real person appeared to pay. Um, so, what is it, what's the role for traditional insurers in this sort of brave new world of... of uh, changing retirement, etc. I mentioned the Standard Life Aberdeen and Phoenix Group partnership earlier, and I think it's useful to spend a few minutes explaining um, what we've done and why. We've sold all of our old insurance business as well as our workplace DC business. We've retained what we call our retail platform business, which offers non-insured investment products such as OIX, and have also retained our advice business, which is called 1825. We included our DC business in the sale um, partly because we believe that the investment in operational efficiency required to administer large books of insurance products would also be required for, to administer DC pensions. Standard Life Aberdeen, for its part, wanted to focus on delivery of value through services over and above the administration of assets, such as investment management alpha or the provision of financial advice. Now, it may be that other insurance companies decide to do something similar and split their businesses. The need to compete on wafer-thin margins in DC admin was one of the influences on our decision. Another was the pension freedoms introduced in the UK in 2015, which led to a collapse in the sale of annuities, which were a major and profitable insurance product for the industry. And in a large part, the UK insurance industry was being subsidized by the profits uh, that were made on annuities. Now, I know you've had ARFs in this market for, for yonks. Uh, so pension freedoms is not new to you, but it was a seismic shift in uh, the UK market. Um, as I said earlier, it's, it's sometimes problematic to read across from one market to another, but the split that is happening in the UK between asset management, risk carriers, and administration providers might also take hold in other markets with an increasing uh, pressure to specialise in order to succeed. So if I concentrate on risk carriers for a moment, uh, consumer and societal change is no less profound for them. The advent of the sharing economy has presented challenges to existing insurance models, but also open, opened up new uh, opportunities for innovation. We have a partnership with a, a firm called HDFC in India, and uh, I was speaking recently with some executives from that firm. They're one of India's leading insurers. I was struck by how they're looking to capitalize on changes in customer behavior to sell insurance products with very short-term durations. In a sense, we've always had this kind of innovation, and some uh, of the older members of the audience will remember being able to buy single-trip life insurance policies from vending machines at airports. 
Um, but the proliferation of, of uh, smartphones allows insurers to present really relevant risk management solutions to customers in real time, often at very, very low prices and based on their in-the-moment activity. What HGFC were, were talking to me about was, for instance, the use of Uber or Airbnb, where a customer in India can buy life cover for the period of their Uber trip, which probably tells you something about the state of <laughs> Indian roads. Anyway, th there is a lot of focus on the delivery of this innovation by fintechs, and we know it's a more attractive prospect for many millennials to work at a disruptive startup, startup rather than take a job at an established insurer or reinsurer. But most big companies in our sector now believe that it makes sense to work with fintech startups or try, uh, to try and identify winners. Many companies are also uh, establishing innovation labs in one form or another, trying to repli replicate that fintech environment inside a wider corporate. This is quite difficult to do, and um, I do have some experience with this, but uh, it can be very, very successful, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this topic over the course of today. Uh, looking further forward, many firms are considering the threats and opportunities presented by machine learning and ultimately artificial intelligence. There are some obvious immediate implications in reducing further the search and comparison costs for customers, which will heighten the price competition in some markets to the benefit of scale players. Distribution models will also, I believe, change radically in all parts of the market. Opportunities will arise for innovators in product design, marketing, underwriting, claims management, or more generally, innovators around the whole customer experience. So I hope that gives you some food for thought. We have a lot to cover today, and you'll hear from experts from different parts of our industry about how companies can prepare for the enormous amount of change ahead. Uh, as I said, I've recently celebrated my 30th anniversary in this great industry. The pace of change has increased relentlessly over that period, and that trend looks set to stay. It's an exciting time to be in insurance, and I hope today's forum gives you some ideas about how you might adapt your business to capitalize on change. So thank you for your attention. I think we have some time for questions uh, before our first session, so I'll, I'm happy to take any questions that you've got. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Barry. I think um, it was uh, very interesting to hear how uh, Aberdeen are leading and responding to change um, and uh, to do it first off, and to time, I think, is no small achievement. Uh, just while I'll boot this up um, and uh, go to some of the questions, I was interested in some of your remarks. You were talking about an offering to employers within six minutes and sign up, and that speed to market. Um, in terms of innovation, in, as we go through the value chain, you've clearly looked at your value chain very closely. Do you see particular segments of the chain uh, innovating quicker than others, or where do you see that actually coming from? Yeah, interesting. I, I, I think uh, we've seen much more innovation in underwriting. Um, and if I look at right across, not, not so much in um, Standard Life Aberdeen, but if I think, I, I spent, uh, when I was at Peru, I spent some time with uh, Discovery in South Africa, um, who operate under the Vitality brand in the UK, but they're a fantastic organization. And one of the things, this was maybe, it must be the guts of 10 years ago, and I remember at that point, their use of data was, had outstripped what I had seen in the UK, but they had, they had um, established huge amounts of correlations around uh, insurance. So they knew at the time, for instance, some, they had some detailed models about um, the correlation between your BMI, your body mass index, and your claims experience on motor. Uh, which I, ha I wasn't aware of, but I became aware of then. They even had correlations of between which newspaper, which local newspaper you, you read in Johannesburg and your claims experience. So what they were able to do was overlay the use of that data on the local insurance market, and they were by far and away the most profitable um, motor insurance writer in, uh, in South Africa. Um, so I think the, in, in terms of underwriting, we've maybe seen earlier uh, innovation. I think um, the next wave of innovation is coming in marketing and distribution. So um, uh, particularly if I, if I concentrate on, on sort of my part of the market in the um, long-term savings or life and pensions, we have in the UK still 
a ridiculously antiquated model which is very heavily uh, face to face. We haven't seen the digital revolution in anything like uh, it's been seen in other industries and now that is changing. I mean the good to go solution is, is maybe a, a, an early sign of that um, and that was born out of necessity rather than um, particularly out of, des uh, out of intelligent design. Um, but, it's, but it is an indication of where the market's going and I think particularly in, in uh, retail distribution to end customers, that's probably going to accelerate very rapidly. Thanks very, thanks very much for that. We just have a question here um, on Slido uh, from someone in our audience who has asked um, that two of the key uh, elements you saw in, um, in the UK was auto enrollment and the decline of, of, of DB. And just asking about market dynamics, I think we probably know what might be next for the UK, or maybe not. Depends on what the end of March brings. But what do you see as driving in terms of the life market and pensions market in the UK? What do you see as a big next externality? Um, well, it, it's interesting. The life and pensions market has been dominated by auto enrollment. So the the um, the result is, or sorry, the the reality is that auto enrollment sucks up a huge amount of discretionary saving. And for most um, retail customers, saving more into your auto enrollment scheme is the best thing to do. Uh, not least because it's very uh, low cost, but also because um, many people have employer matches that they don't uh, take full advantage of. So it, it's, what we're seeing is that um, that sort of mass market uh, business in the UK has simplified a huge amount into um, auto enrollment pensions and then um, ISA's individual savings accounts, which are tax preferred, um, uh, non-pension savings. And between the, there's a 20,000 pounds a year tax allowance on uh, ISA's, there's a 40,000 pounds a year tax uh, allowance on pensions. And clearly the number of people who can afford to save anything like 60,000 pounds a year out of discretionary income is very, very small. So th those two products are now uh, dominating and simplifying the, um, the pensions landscape. And I think that's, that's set to continue. What that enables is, I think, the rise of, uh, of robo-advisors. So um, we are building, in Standard Life Aberdeen, we're building a robo-advice um, capability, which is essentially an online digital advice uh, uh, operation. Um, it's probably actually less, going to be less robo-advice and more bionic advice. Um, it's horrible, all the terms that get, <laughs> get invented. But the difference between robo and bionic is that with bionic, there is a human involved. Um, it's just that the, ro the, the, uh, the computer does all the heavy lifting and the human then uh, has the value add reassurance of the customer that um, they have navigated their, their way through the system properly and uh, they're not doing something stupid. And it's actually bionic advice that's taken over in uh, the US. Um, it may be a, a maturity thing, and maybe it'll, it'll become more machine-based eventually, but uh, that's certainly where I see the UK going. Um, I have an interesting question here. I think they're, they're driving for a figure, but I might just ask it in a slightly different way. And it's about the, um, the spend for innovation uh, within Aberdeen uh, uh, Standard Life. Um, and how has that changed over the last four to five years, and where do you see it going in the, the next four to five years? Have you made changes to your teams, for example? And how is innovation brought to the core of what you do? Yeah, I mean, If you I, want to give them the number, you can. I, I think we'll, <laughs> I'd be killed if I gave the number, I okay. think. Okay. The, the, um, uh, yes, we've tried lots of different things, and I see, I see that uh, on the agenda that I think we're going to talk about this later on today. But uh, we have tried this, this innovation lab idea whereby we try and create a different environment, uh, employ different types of people, and uh, let them loose on a particular problem. Uh, that is um, a very successful way of approaching it, actually. What, where you run into challenges uh, is industrializing it subsequently and um, trying to avoid a sort of a demonos uh, culture appearing between the, the, the kids who get to sit on beanbags and, uh, and the people who have to wear a tie to work. Um, but the, the, but it is, it's, I, I think uh, organizations need to play with these sorts of models because uh, we've definitely got some benefit. And we have had to invest quite, uh, quite heavily. We did invest heavily in the run-up to auto-enrollment in the digital solutions, particularly around um, good to go. We're investing heavily now in the build of robo-advice as well as on our, our um, IFA platforms, our broker platforms. Uh, so it, it's, it's, uh, it is not cheap. 
And it is, uh, you, you mentioned you have to recruit different people, and, and you definitely do. Um, I think I'm reluctant to throw the baby out with the bathwater because I think you do need some of the, uh, the skills that a life company traditionally has, has um, inculcated, like actuarial skills, commercial skills, etc. But uh, you do need to have a better mix. Thank you, Barry. And um, I'm just going to take one last question here from Slido. And uh, it's a bit of self-interest. It's going to be another just... Um, uh, auto enrollment question because that's very much on our minds here. Um, following pension freedoms in the UK, how is the market adapted in terms of delivering um, retirement solutions? Has you, have, you, have you seen that as particularly yeah, it's a, important? It's a really interesting one because the um, I think it's probably common knowledge that the uh, the pension freedoms came as a little bit of a surprise to everybody, including our regulators. And the regulator has, has been trying to work with making the, the system work. Um, it's the human behavior is such, and the hatred for annuities was such that uh, the sales of annuities dropped at my firm to something like two to four percent of customers of retirement buying an annuity. Right. Um, so a massive, massive backlash. Uh, and most people then uh, managing their, their money in income drawdown in retirement. Um, actually, funnily enough, with the advent of robo-advice, um, we may see a push back towards annuities because um, the robot will always tell the customer that there is a point at which annuitizing uh, and pooling your insurance risk, pooling your longevity risk with other people in your cohort makes sense. It might not be at 65, it might be at 75, but it is very often best advice. And it's quite interesting watching the dynamic with the build of robo-advice and also the way that the regulators in the UK are viewing the market, what's worked well post-pension freedoms and what's worked less well. And um, actually, I think the, the uh, annuities will, will grow as a, as a product, but it might take a decade for us to get there. Thank you, Barry. I think we're going to um, release you from your obligations at this point. Um, I know I found your remarks extremely interesting and insightful, and uh, I think you've set a very high standard for everyone to follow during the day. So, delegates, if I could just ask, in the, uh, could we uh, show our appreciation for Barry again? We appreciate your time. You. Barry, thanks a million. Appreciate it. <laughs>